from the capital of Raider Nation, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's silver and black today. Your daily dose of all things Las Vegas Raiders football. News, views, guests, and your phone calls are all part of the game plan. There's only one nation, and it listens here. Now your host, Scott Colbranson. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on this Wednesday. And we go out on the newsmaker line and bring in Raiders royalty, one of the greats to ever play for the Silver and Black. That, of course, is their all-time sack leader, Greg Townsend, played for the Raiders from 1983 to 93, and then again in 97, a fourth-round draft pick out of TCU, one of Compton's best and brightest to come out of Dominguez High School. It is Greg Townsend joins us today. Greg, thanks for being with Q and I here on Silver and Black today. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Q. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the introduction. I saw how you first started off with royalty. And just to let you know, Al Davis always said, in case we meet the queen, we wouldn't be embarrassed to show her our ring. So that's why he, he got the Super Bowl ring the way he did it for us. Oh, that's that's awesome. And, I mean, like I said, you're the all-time sack leader still with the Raiders. 107 and a half sacks in your career with the Raiders. That's that's 25th all time, by the way, in the NFL history. And the closest, oh. the closest player to you in Raiders history on the Raider record books is Howie Long with 84. So, uh, Greg Townsend, I know, I know a lot of Raider fans uh, appreciate and remember well, how much of a huge contribution you made to this team. Now, let's talk about the Super Bowl. So, you go to Super Bowl 18. Uh, Raiders, of course, a huge win, 38 to nine over Washington. Uh, for you, being a young player, particularly, talk a little bit about about the Super Bowl experience for you playing through that amazing season that you guys had with Coach Flores, but then ending up in New Orleans for that Super Bowl and then winning it? Well, like you said, I was a youngster coming in there. And my experience, I had to do my experience through the older guys who had, who had been Super Bowl 15. And so seeing how they were experiencing it, that's the way I was sort of taught to experience it mm. for, per se. You know, you don't go in these things with no con- preconceived ideas or notions. You know, they just, uh, it's, it's one of those big things when it's just only two teams are going to be playing this weekend. And so everything is coming at you from the media to uh, shoe companies to uh, television shows. I mean, just everything is coming at you all at once. And, and you just tend to just soak it up and see how the older guys are, are treating the situation and, and trying to, uh, um, would you say, navigate yourself through it? Because there is a game at the end of this week. <laughs> <laughs> and we got it, and we playing, we only here to win. So, you know, I, I, I experienced it through them and I had a great experience. And I think uh, one of the best things about that is, is, is the older guys pulling the younger guys under the wings like me and Paquel and, and Caldwell and Doki Williams. And there's a lot of young guys on that team that year. And, and uh, we were just fortunate to have veterans the way we did. Greg, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about Coach Flores. Obviously, he was your your co- head coach when you guys won that Super Bowl. And, and one was just how did he navigate through the week and how did he navigate you guys up until that Super Bowl? And what made him, what, what kind of buttons did he push to make sure that you guys were all ready to go and, and in prime position to go win that game? I know, Q. You ready to hear some big old story about Tom Flores? telling us, you know, we got to win this game and, and and giving us these rah-rah speeches and stuff like that. But, you know, Tom is Tom. <laughs> Tom was laid back. He kind of let the veterans again uh, uh, do their thing because the veterans were speaking on winning all all year long. So he kind of let them just keep riding, the, uh, you know, riding that train out. And uh, Tom didn't really have much to say, man. He really didn't. And the way he navigated, the way he did the whole season long, he, like I said before, he just let the veterans just guide the train. Uh, speaking with Greg Townsend, Raider great, of course, all-time sack leader in the silver and black. And Greg, when you talk about that and Tom Flores kind of being being laid back and mellow, just like he is in his new Coors Light commercial, of course, trying to get him in the Hall of Fame yeah, as he should yeah. be in. Um, uh-huh. But was that was that something that was really uh, great for you guys, that he didn't change his approach so it was kind of business as usual? Now, let me say this. <laughs> Who am I talking to? Q or Scott? This is Scott. I'm talking to both of you. Matter yeah. of fact, I'm talking to both <laughs> of you. So, so let me say this. Now, you know what anybody that's really quiet, like Tom, 
being portrayed is really quiet. They have another side to them. Mm. And I've seen that side before. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to see that side. <laughs> nice. You don't want to see that side. Uh, I tell you, it was one, I'll tell you a story real quick. Uh, my rookie year again, I think it may, may, may my second year. We were out there practicing training camp, and uh, Andy Parker was our backup tight end to Todd Christensen. He was, he kept holding me for some odd reason, and I kept going inside his head. <laughs> so Tom said to me, he goes, Townsend, you can't be out here fighting every play. And I made the mistake of saying, well, tell him to stop holding. <laughs> Tom unleashed on me, man. I'm telling you, he said, you don't tell me what to do. I'm the head coach. Get off the field. And I said, <laughs> I'm, I'm walking off the field, but I'm trying to explain to coach. Coach, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I didn't mean it that you... <laughs> You tell him what to do. I was just kind of saying that as a figure of speech, but I just kept walking off the field, and I'm just thinking, man, this, I don't want to see that side ever again. <laughs> so I'm just saying, he has another side to him. We He just did an, enough winning that we kept him cool and calm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Greg, expanding on that, how have you seen the game change and the way that players are now, it's not really what the head coach says is all that matters. It's kind of like the, the players have such a large voice now in the room that it's just, it feels different than it did when you played. Well, uh <clears throat> Again, um, it was more emphasis on team and family when I played. Uh, you know, you played for the other guy. You played for the coach. I mean, you know, you hardly ever played for yourself. It wasn't that. It wasn't that rule in there then. Um, so what it was, you were just playing for other people, and, and and you had a bunch of tough guys. You really did. You had a bunch of tough guys who were gonna play hurt because they. They knew the team needed them. Today, you have guys <laughs> that are more independent, more um, uh, more vocal, and knowing from the from the veterans before them, kind of how the league don't take care of you once you once you're done. Mm. You know, so players are now starting to say, "Hey, I need to take care of my own business," and 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 and. Uh, they're making enough money nowadays, too. Uh, I always had this saying in the 70s, you work, you play football to work during the offseason. And in the 80s and 90s, you play to work when your career is over. Today, they don't have to work. So I, I, I sense that they are just more vocal because they have more money. And rightfully so, they should. And... Uh, because the league, league do let you down once you're out of the league. So they they need to take care of themselves and 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 uh, to be more independent about their future. Um, because uh, it's tough. It's really tough, and uh, they just need to. Uh, 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 I'm just mumbling now, but they just need to really just take care of themselves and understand that uh, it, it's life after football. Yeah, Greg Townsend, Raider Great, is our guest here on Silver and Black today. And Greg, building on that a little bit, because one of the things I've been talking about over the last few weeks is, you know, with the younger players, not only has the money changed, not only has the personal branding and all this stuff where they're creating businesses for themselves, like you said, to, to help them when they get out, uh, but also to maximize their revenue um, when they are playing, is social media. You know, Q and I always talk about it. Q calls it a cesspool. I don't disagree with him on that. But uh, when you were playing... You had, you know, if when you were at a game, fans could yell all kinds of things at you, and that's where you dealt with it. Then, you know, you had the media sometimes would be adversarial, and you might have a reporter that you like. You might have one that you don't like. Um, nowadays, though, these young guys, they're interacting with people who don't like them, who provoke them into arguments online every day. Can you imagine that? I mean, can you imagine John Matuzak in the, in the, in the <laughs> realm of, of social media? And what would it, how different would it have been for you if all you those John Matu says, how about Lyle Alzado? Lyle Alzado, exactly. He, 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 might, he might have broken a phone every day. Oh, he oh. would tell him, come meet me. Come meet me. <laughs> well, it, but, that, but that's the point, Greg. Can you imagine playing today, like, you know, if you had a down game or something, because everybody, everybody doesn't play a perfect game every time. Can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, and these young guys who are growing up with it, the added pressure and then the added distraction of, of these people talking about you and coming at you from different directions. How do you feel about that? What has been your observation? Um, 
you know, um, I'll tell you, back in the day when we were playing, uh, like you said, there was reporters we liked and reporters we didn't like. So there were reporters who wrote bad things about you when you didn't play good, and, and, and they really drug you through the mud. I mean, they really did. Mm-hmm. And uh, we always approach that as uh, um, uh, it's like uh, a ship sinking. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, who's going who's gonna to bail off first? It's all the rats. <laughs> the rats gonna butt hell off first. They gonna cause they they gonna sense the danger and they gonna they gonna they gonna start fleeing first. And that's who we saw as anybody that chirped on us that was doing uh, saying anything negative about us. They were rats. So anytime we was gonna play bad, they was gonna be the first one to chirp or first one to bail off the ship. So uh, you just look at that like uh, any other thing. Um, uh, you play bad, you're going to get some negative group. <laughs> you know, I, I ain't going to even say you play bad. If you lose, you're going to get, you can play bad and, and win and still, you know, everybody think you play great. Mm-hmm. But that's the thing, like you're saying, when today, if you play bad, everybody wants to talk about how uh, bad you played, like, like they were good at it. <laughs> they could play it and stuff. So again, you treat them like rats. They just chirping because they can behind a computer screen or, or you know, they Facebook or whatever they're doing. They could chirp behind there all day long, but they could never do what you do. Period. So if you could see it, if they young guys could see it like that, they'd be fine. But if they can't, they got thin skin. It's going to get to them every time. Well, speaking of doing what you do, uh, Scott mentioned multiple times that you're the franchise leader in, in sacks, and, and that's something that the current Raiders, uh, obviously they need. They need a lot of uh, guys that can get to the quarterback. Pressure is something that they've been struggling with. They got a couple guys that look like they could turn that corner and possibly be that dude. But, Greg, you were what I like to call as an alpha dog and, and absolutely were that guy that kind of commanded the locker room and, and your play backed it up on the field. What does it take? What, do you, what does it take for a player to go from being being a good player to a great player to being, like I said, that alpha dog player? Uh, it's simple. It's very simple. It's called attitude. It's called attitude, attitude, attitude. My coach always said 90% of the game is talking trash. <laughs> the other 10% is bagging up all that you just said. So if you if you're going to talk it, you got to walk it. And right. it's just that sense. And it comes with attitude. You think you, if you believe you the baddest son of a gun out there, then you are. And nobody can stop you. I'm telling you, my man, I watch this game and I love this game. And I can see when guys got their mind made up to do what they're going to do. You, you can almost sense it through the TV. I can almost sense it through the TV. And I, 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 I focus on that person for some odd reason, but I know I'm sensing it through the TV. He's getting ready to do something, you know, spectacular because he's got his mind made up. And um, and one guy I used to see do that all the time was is, is our guy, uh, uh, Bo Jackson. Mm-hmm. You could just tell when he had his mind made up. So that's the sense of what I was doing when I played. And matter of fact, that was another thing I did. I always match my game up with some of our other star players. So if Bo Jackson's having a good game, Greg getting ready to have a good game. Mark is having a good game, Greg getting ready. How he having a good game, Greg getting ready to have a good game. So my, I would just feed off of other people who who we were expecting to have a good game to have a good game. Because you would notice a lot of times, uh, especially in the 80s, I, I believe so much in the 90s when Art Shell was coaching, we always started on defense, whether we won the coin toss or not. Yeah. Because yeah. we was going to set the tempo on defense. It was just that simple. We were going to get a three and out real quick and set the tempo by trying to do something on that first play to make get this thing started. So that was the attitude as well. So coming with that attitude, it was just for me just to show up because they always said big-time players – shows up in big time games and I was the one because I tell you um, like you mentioned that Super Bowl earlier I was the first rookie to ever have a sack in a Super Bowl and and yes. and only one had only one been since me and that was Bosa yep. uh, last year 
So right. it became that type of deal with me because I'm saying, ain't no rookie ever done this that I've done. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's say I measure myself up to that. I'm doing stuff that nobody has done. Yeah. Right. Up until Bosa last year. So, um, you know, you pick out your little spots where you played this game and you say, Hey, this is my contribution to the game. And, and man, I did it earlier than anybody. And as a fourth round pick, cause you expect the first round pick to do it. But as a fourth round pick, you don't expect for that. So give them what they want, Greg. <laughs> Greg Townsend is our guest here on Silver and Black today. And Greg, as, as Q talked about, you know, and you watched the Raiders and covered the Raiders too um, in various ways this year, and you saw that defense and, and, and at times played so poorly, but you had talent there. They weren't maximizing it. They make the coaching change. Uh, for those young players who kind of uh, maybe lost their way a little bit, how do they find that? Is, is, is that, to, to Q's point about having that alpha dog in the locker room on defense, to keep the group accountable for those young guys, how do how do they have to make the switch now? They got a new coach. No, undoubtedly, the Raiders are going to go out and get probably a couple g- a good bodies uh, to help with that defense. What do they need to do next to make that jump uh, so that they can be at least a middle of the road defense so this team can get in the playoffs? Well, first of all, you got to have see. You know, you have this control chaos, and you have this uh, you have this thing called. Uh, Reckless and abandoned, mm-hmm. uh, with 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 discipline, you got to play this game both with both both of those things in mind. You got to play this game uh, uh, almost like uh, uh, Belichick says. You first got to do your job. You got to do if you do this, then damn it, contain and do your job. If you are a, a, a three technique, plug it up. Mm-hmm. You one technique, plug it up. If you're a linebacker, fill it. If you're cornered, cover it. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's all you ask these people to do. <laughs> do your job, and then the rest can work its way out, work itself out, and then we can move on from there. We can do put the exotic stuff in there then. But until we can do the basics, we can't even do the, the exotic stuff. So that's what I'm getting at. What I was watching this, this year from the defense, everybody was trying to, I guess, I'm going to say this to be nice. They were uh, trying too hard. Mm -hmm. Because they kept getting out of position. They kept getting, I mean, come on, we in the pros. Why are guys playing up so high on the D-line? Why you can't play underneath the guy? Mm. What's wrong with that? Come on, man. And then for our linebackers, you can't cover that back coming out the backfield. Now, if you know you can't cover them, now what you know you need to do, you got to cheat a little bit. Cheat a little bit so you can cover that guy a little bit better. And we can get a little pressure on that quarterback. But if you got somebody to throw to, we can pass rush all day long and then nothing's going to happen. <laughs> so these are things that need to be taken care of from the young guys' perspective. One, to get their job done and understand what control chaos to what uh, reckless and abandoned with a little discipline. They have to play like that. You just can't go out there playing reckless and and just chasing a ball. I mean, you just can't go chasing a ball. You got to go through it, through your door. So that's what I would tell them, because that's what we did when we played. And everybody covered their own ass. That's how you do that. You got a CYA. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And Greg, we love we love hearing the passion and the energy that you have talking about the Raiders. So let me just be ask a simple question. What does it mean to you to be a part of the forever fraternity that is the Raiders? It's the world to me. It's it's, it's the world. Um, me and a bunch of the guys, we still talk, and it's always great to see them. It's always great to talk to them. It's all, it, I mean, it's not just good. It's just not all right. It's great to see those guys. It's just great to be in a company. It's, 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 it's just good because when you think about when we, at least me, I'm going to say me. I'm going to talk about me. When I'm with I'm, when I'm with those guys, all the little stories about them come rushing back to my mind. <laughs> uh, it's like Reggie Kinlaw when I first got to the league uh, with him, and he just told me, he said, "Hey, if you're gonna make this team, you have to make it on your own. Forget trying to make friends. You need to make the team first. 
and then you make friends afterwards. It's it's little stories I hear about, uh, you know, Alzado telling us, you know, hey man, this is a league is 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 not for long. They only care about what you've done for them lately, not what you've done for them last year or a year before. So hearing those things gives you a sense of urgency to play when you were playing, but when you win, all that stuff is just like, I don't know how to describe it other than sweet. Mm. It's just sweet. All that hard work, all the work you put in, it just turns out sweet when you win. And so when you win with those guys, and I'm, i tell you another story about Reggie Kinlaw too. One time I was, uh, it was my rookie year, and I had scored a safety. I already scored a safety and scored a touchdown. So the players was kind of putting their arms around me, per se. You know, they going, hey, Greg, you one of us. You play like a Raider, da 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 So anyhow, we in Buffalo. And Buffalo was winning this game. We had a minute and eight seconds left. And I'm going down the sideline. Come on, guys, get your head out your butts and do this and do that and do that. And Reggie looked at me and said, come here, Rook. Stand over there by me and shut the hell up. We're going to win this <laughs> <laughs> And watch us win this game. <laughs> and I just watched us, you know, how we just call plays and just you know, as uh, as my man Hank Strandwards trickling the ball down the field, <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw that then, and I'm like, okay, uh, I'm sitting, I'm standing over there by Reggie, and, and, and Bart, come on, kick the field goal, we win the game. He said, see, next time, don't be saying all that shit. <laughs> and I'm going like, you know, you, you know, because it just showed that I had no little, I had no faith, you know, in us. That's why he was saying next time, don't so, you gotta have faith in us. You guys know we're gonna still win, man. Oh, this time on the clock, we still gonna win. I'm, and that's what made me a believer. And then, you know, that stuff is what is contagious about being a Raider. You just get the feeling of this stuff, and this stuff just always supposed to happen for us. And it did when we were playing, when I was playing. So it just came one of those things, man, that I just, when I'm around those guys, all those stories come back, and I just love being around them. Oh, man, I can I, I can imagine sitting at a table with you guys. I don't I don't know that I, I would I would say a word. I would just keep listening because those stories <laughs> are phenomenal. Now, before we... Before, and I'll be the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many guys. Uh, mm -hmm. But, Greg, before we let you go, and we appreciate you spending so much time with us today, uh, we got the Super Bowl on Sunday. Now, I went back, I was watching some video of your playing days, and I found that brawl on October 5th, 1986 with the Chiefs. So I'm going to assume uh -huh. you're not a big Chiefs fan. Um, <laughs> what about this game on Sunday? You know, you have Tom Brady with uh, at, at, at his advancing age of 43 years old, uh, takes the Buccaneers back to the Super Bowl, where you won your Super Bowl in Tampa, by the way. Uh, mm, and, and, they're, and they're yeah. playing the Chiefs, and this kid, Patrick Mahomes, who is in, an incredible athlete. Uh, how do you see this game unfolding? Uh, do the Bucks have a chance because of Tom Brady and that defense, or you think the Chiefs are going to pull this one out and win back to back? Okay, here it is. This is this is my belief. Played the Washington Redskins back in uh, '84. Mm -hmm. It's Super Bowl eighteen. You look at our sideline. You look at their sideline. They only had, as far as I'm concerned, and I could be wrong, but I don't. You know, I, I looked over there. Only person they had was Charlie Taylor on that coaching staff that played the game. I looked on our sideline. We had Willie Brown, Fred Lednikov, Art Shell, Terrell Bisky, uh, uh, Tom Flores. We had we had several coaches who played the game on our sideline. With that in mind, I'm telling you guys. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. If if, if nothing else that you heard from me today. <laughs> That's what. That's how we won. That's how we won. When you get those veterans, those coaches who play the game and can talk to the players and set them on a on a on an even keel. I mean, when I I mean, Archell told me this before the game. Greg, just do them like you be doing us in practice. That's it. That's all he said. That's all he said. And what do you think that did to me? That mm -hmm. lit the fire of desire in my butt. <laughs> I'm going like my man. So, so what I'm getting at, guys, is all the Super Bowls I've looked at, I've always looked at the sidelines and see who's over the culture. And now we we're back to that again. The only one I've seen on the sideline for the Chiefs that played the game is the enemy. Now on the other side, you got Todd Bowles, you got Brian Leftwich, you got Kevin Ross, mm -hmm. you have Todd McNair. For some, no one that played the game. 
And for that, and those and those guys are in key key positions too. Kevin Ross at the corner, uh, McNear at the um, running back, and you know the other two are coordinators. And I'm saying they're going to win this game. Now I said this earlier uh, last earlier this year, but I even said it uh, last year when they started combining these guys on their staff. They just happen to have. Uh, Winston quarterback and four. That was, that was a problem. They had to need to get another quarterback. But uh, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, of course, you said about the '86 brawl, which was, you know, uh, I don't know how to explain that. I didn't get kicked out the game, but they kicked me out the next game with no pay. Yeah, yeah. That was it. Was terrible. And then, uh, so I never liked the Chiefs because I think they're a bunch of front runners. To tell you the truth, <laughs> I, I do. I, I'm telling you, man. We used to wear them out. They used to uh, be looking so sad over there on the sideline. <laughs> and if they got one little play of like, like if they got a little first down or whatever the case may be, those suckers would be cheering like they win in the game. <laughs> and I'd be like, y'all, a bunch of front runners. I mean, they would literally stick their tongue out at us. Uh, I mean, I'm just telling you, this this is what makes you not like the, a team like that. Yeah. So, because they didn't know how to win. And so now they win winning. But that's how I'm looking at this. I'm thinking Tampa Bay is going to wear them out. Tom Brady is going to Tom Brady's going to wear that ass out. <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. Greg Townsend, uh, all-time sack leader for the Raiders uh, and a great, great ambassador for the franchise and for the former players. Greg, thanks for spending so much time today with Q and I. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Q. I appreciate you guys. And keep up the good work, man. And go Raiders, baby. All right, there you go. Greg Townsend was our guest. We're going to hit a break here. When we come back, Silver and Black Today rolls on.